Chapter 2. I could have danced all night. Oh, Robert, I said the moment we walked into the school gymnasium and saw how wonderfully the dance committee had decorated. I wish Carrie had come. He wouldn't be so down on the dance if he saw what they've done to this place. It looks like a real ballroom. I don't think that's what really kept him from coming, Laura, Robert said softly. He smiled sympathetically, his eyes soft and gentle. I nodded, knowing he was right. There was a makeshift stage directly in front of us and for, for the four-piece band. They were already playing and the floor was crowded with dancers. Above us, ribbons of crepe paper crisscrossed around multicolored balloons with long tails of tinsel. At the far right, there was long tables with red, green, and blue paper tablecloth set up for food. To the left, and down the sides of the gymnasium, there were tables, the same color paper as the tablecloths and chairs. A large poster on the left wall read, Welcome to the Annual Spring Festival. Everyone was dressed up. Some of the girls in dresses so formal and expensive looking, I was sure Mommy would feel she had what she had made for me was inadequate even though I thought my dress was just perfect. However, I was happy now that I agreed to wear mommy's necklace. Many of the girls wore earring necklaces, bracelets, and rings on most of their fingers. It looked like a contest to see who would be the most overdressed. Well, Robert said, after we put my shawl on the chair and set my purse aside, why don't we join the fun? He led me to the dance floor and we began dancing. As we moved across the crowded floor, I felt as if everyone's eyes were on us. When I let my gaze shift from Robert's, I saw some of the girls in class gathered in a small pack, watching us with twisted smiles on their faces. I felt a tightness in my stomach. The music was loud and fast. I hope I didn't look foolish, but Robert seemed pleased. He was a very good dancer and I started to imitate some of his movements with my arms and hips. As long as I concentrated on him, fixed my eyes on his, I felt secure and comfortable. He had such an air of confidence about him. There was enough for me to share. When there was a pause between the songs, we stopped, embraced each other, and laughed. He turned me toward the punch bowl, waving to some of the boys he knew, and they waved back giving Robert the thumbs up sign to indicate they approved. We're gonna have fun tonight, he promised, his eyes full of excitement. We're gonna dance until our feet beg for mercy. Did I do all right out there, I asked. Are you kidding? If they have a dance contest, we're entering, he said. Robert Royce, we are not. Just the thought of such a thing took my breath away. We drank some punch and ate some chips with cheese dip. Marsha Winslow, the class president, Adam Jackson, joined us. Marsha was in charge of the party. She was a tall, attractive girl who spoke with a slightly nasal tone, as if she were looking down her nose at the rest of the world. She carried a clipboard. Excuse me, she said, but we don't have any record of you paying for your tickets. What? Of course you do. I gave my money to Betty Hargate, Robert said. Betty has you down, but not Laura, she replied. That's ridiculous. Are you calling Marsha ridiculous, Adam asked. You know, she doesn't get paid for doing all this work. That makes it impossible for everyone else to enjoy themselves. She's just doing her job. I'm not calling her ridiculous. I'm just saying, where's Betty? There she is, Robert pointed. Let's call her over, he suggested. Good idea, Adam said, and he waved at Betty, who was standing with Lorraine Rudolph. The two hurried over. What's up, Betty demanded impatiently, her hand on her hip. It was as if she had been asked to wallow with the undesirables. Robert Royce claims, Marcia said, rolling her eyes, that he paid for Laura too, but that's not indicated on the sheet I have. 
I gave you the money in the cafeteria last Tuesday, Robert insisted. Remember? Whatever's written on the paper is what I received, Betty said in a sing-song smug voice. I don't have to steal a party ticket money. I didn't say you stole it, Robert cried, growing increasingly frustrated. I only have one ticket marked off after your name, Marcia repeated. That means you paid for only one ticket. I can't believe this, Robert said. Are you sure you just didn't think you paid for Laura's? Maybe you weren't sure she was going with you last Tuesday, Laura quipped. A tight smile on her lips. She shifted her eyes to Adam and then back to Robert. Of course I'm sure I paid, Robert maintained. All the money checks out, Marcia said. That means we don't have more money than tickets issued, Adam added. I know what it means, Robert said. Do you have the tickets, Robert? I whispered. He thought a moment and then nodded with a confident smile, pulling them out of the inside sports jacket. If I didn't pay for them, how did I get them, he asked Marcia, thrusting the tickets in front of her face. She gazed at the tickets and then looked at the clipboard again. I don't understand, she said. Maybe Betty gave him two tickets and he promised to give her the money for the second one later, Adam suggested. Yes, Betty said quickly, that's it. No, it's not, and you know it, Robert insisted. Betty's too responsible to give out tickets and not collect the money for them, I suggested calmly. Everyone paused and gazed at me a moment. Someone just made a simple mistake. Well, Marcia glanced at Adam. I don't think Robert would steal a dance ticket. Do you, I followed? I hope not, Betty blurted. We'll straighten it out, Marcia said. Right now, we're all just wasting time and we should be having fun. Exactly, Adam said, taking her arm to the dance floor. Madam Chairman? The others laughed and left with them. That was a pretty stupid bit of meanness, Robert said, glaring after them. Maybe it's just an honest mistake, Robert. He continued to glare in their direction, just daring one of them to look back at us. Somehow I doubt it, he said. Those kind don't make honest mistakes. Let's not let him ruin our night, Robert, I said, touching his hand. He relaxed and smiled at me and nodded. Right, shall we, he asked, taking the punch glass from my hand and putting it on one of the tables. We returned to the dance floor. It didn't take us long to get lost in the music and each other. We soon forgot about the ticket incident and danced until I declared my feet were really begging for mercy. Robert laughed and suggested it was time we had something to eat anyway. I guess we've worked up an appetite. We've got a line and we got in line and filled our plates. And some of the girls in my English class complimented on my dancing and the girls who had came together without dates gathered around Robert commenting on his dancing ability too. Teresa Patterson was there with some of her Brava friends. They kept to themselves, but Teresa gave me a bright, friendly smile when I waved. As I looked over the endless plates of food, I had to give the devils their due. Betty and Marcia had planned a wonderful party. There were steamed clams, of course, and all sorts of chicken dishes, including southern fried, bowls of tricolor pasta, salads, plates of fruit, loaves of Portuguese bread, rolls, and a table of desserts that would surely be the first to be picked clean. We were satisfied. We'd taken a bit of everything to sample. Robert and I sat with some of his friends and their dates. Everyone was so excited and they all talked at once. I really was having the time of my life. And when Robert leaned over to give me a small quick kiss on the cheek, I blushed and told him how much fun I was having. I'm so glad, he said. I was worried when Carrie was so negative about the dance. I thought he might might what? Talk you out of coming, Robert confessed. He could never do that. We may be twins, but I still have a mind of my own, Robert. 
That's good, he said, smiling. You should know that by now, if you, and if you don't, you will soon, I promised. Even I was surprised at how seductively it came out. His eyes widened with his smile. I turned away quickly, afraid I would become so crimson that everyone at the table would notice. After we ate, the music got slower and the lights grew dim. I like this kind of dancing more because I could rest my head against Robert's shoulder and feel his arms around me. We swayed to the rhythm, neither of us wanting to spoil the moment by talking. Occasionally, I felt his lips on my forehead and hair. My heart pounded so hard, I was sure he could feel it against his chest. I'm so glad you came to the dance with me, Laura, he whispered. Me too, I said. Maybe we can leave a little early and just take a ride along the shore. It's a beautiful night, he said. I like that, Robert. We moved through the shadows and light. I was dazzled by the glow of the round lanterns, and for a while it was as if Robert and I were the only ones at the dance. Everyone else just faded away. That was until I heard Janet Parker's sharp, cold laugh right behind us and turned to see her standing with Adam Jackson, Marsha, Betty, and Lorraine. Brad Lawton and Grant Simpson had joined them as well. Why weren't they dancing, I wondered. Did they come here just to watch and make fun of others? They kept looking our way and laughing. What's with them now, Robert muttered. I don't care, I said. But he couldn't stop gazing at them, his eyes filling more and more with fury. It's got something to do with us, he said sharply and stopped dancing. Robert, forget about them. I'd like to know what's so damn funny, he said, taking my hand and crossing the dance floor toward them. They parted, expecting we would walk between them, but Robert paused. Why don't you let us in on your little joke, he said sharply. Excuse me, Adam said with a self-satisfied smirk. You want to hear a little joke? They all laughed. What's with you people, Robert pursued. I tried to tug his hand, but he was determined to have his say. Are you trying to ruin our good time? I feel sorry for you if that's all you have to keep you occupied. Are you kidding me? Adam said, surprised that anyone would dare question his actions. Well, we just wondered why Laura's brother didn't come to the dance. Couldn't he afford a ticket? Lorraine asked. Robert could have bought him one of the same way he bought Laura's, Adam suggested. That's not funny, Robert said, stepping toward him. Adam took a step back and held up his hands. Hey, take it easy. You want to hear a little joke, didn't you? That's not a joke. You're a joke, Robert shot back. Whoa, buddy, Brad said. Robert's glare put him back a step, too. They all looked so shallow and cowardly to me, despite their expensive clothing and jewels. Come on, Robert, I said. Let's not waste any more time on them. The reason we're wondering about your brother, Janet said, is Grant just came from having a cigarette and said that he saw him loitering in the parking lot. What? That's right. He's out there in the cold, dreaming of being in here with his sister, Brad blurted. Robert's arm shot out so quickly, I didn't realize he had moved until I saw his hand bounce off Robert's chest, sending him backwards so awkwardly he lost his balance and landed hard on the gym floor. Some of the kids around him started to laugh. He turned red, but after scurrying back to his feet, he kept his distance. That was very rude, Betty exclaimed. Maybe where you came from, that happens all the time, but we aren't allowed to do that at our parties. Her eyes widened and she groaned. Oh no, Mr. Rosner's coming across already. He'll make us cut the party short if there's any wild or stupid stuff. And I worked hard to make this a success, she cried, her mouth twisted and distorted. What's going on here, Mr. Rosner demanded, his hands on his hips. He looked from Brad to Robert and then at the others. Just a silly joke, Mr. Rosner, Ab Adam said smoothly, cutting in front of him. It's nothing. We're all cool. Mr. Rosner studied everyone, and although he wasn't satisfied, nodded. I don't want any roughhousing, he warned. You won't, Adam said. I guarantee it, sir, 
As class president, I'll take full responsibility. I'm sure you will, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Rosner said. When his eyes fixed on me, he calmed down. You all look very nice, he said, and up until now, this has been a very nice affair. I hope you'll continue to make us proud of you. Thank you, Mr. Rosner, Lorraine said sweetly. I saw the corner of his mouth twitch and he turned and started away. That was close, Adam said, glaring at Robert. It wasn't his fault, I said. No, that's for sure, Betty said. Actually, we all feel sorry for him. What's that supposed to mean, Robert demanded. Robert, come on, I pleaded, desperate to get Robert away before they could elaborate on ugly rumors. No, what's that supposed to mean, he pursued. Why don't you go out and ask her brother, Janet quipped, and they all started to smile. Shall we dance, Adam asked Marcia, holding out his hand. Anything to get away from this incestuous atmosphere, she said, and they laughed and broke up to go their separate ways to leave us standing alone. Spoiled rich. It's all right, Robert. Let's not pay any attention to them. He nodded and then looked at me. Don't you think Grant was telling the truth? Do you think Carrie's hanging around out there? I hope not, I said. I'm sure he made it up just to hurt us. Robert forced a smile. If you want to go for that ride now, he said finally, it's fine with me. The air is getting stale in here. Yes, I would, I answered him, and I hoped was a cherry tone of voice. His mood softened. Great. I want to be sure that I get you home before 12, he said. I wouldn't want your father mad at me. Most of the time, Daddy's growl is worse than his bite, I said. I'm not worried about being bitten. I'm worried about being forbidden, Robert said, slipping his hand into mine, forbidden to see you. Our eyes met, and I felt a warm glow travel from my stomach to my heart. Was it possible to want to be with anyone more than I wanted to be with Robert? I didn't think so. Surely this was what love was, and it had happened to me so soon after we set eyes on each other. It must be true love. Did that mean it was written in the stars, like it had been for Romeo and Juliet? That was fine, as long as we didn't have the same destiny, I thought. We started out of the gymnasium, gazing back only once to see Betty and Adam looking our way laughing. It filled me with dread because it was as if they knew something I didn't. There were some students huddled in the shadows and smoking outside, but I didn't see Carrie anywhere. I realized the breath I had held in my lungs and walked quickly across the front of the school toward the parking lot. We got into Robert's car and glanced at each other, both of us feeling nervous and excited. Robert took a deep breath and started the car. He turned to me. You all right with this? He asked softly. Yes, Robert. I slid over to be closer to him and he smiled. We drove out of the parking lot slowly. I looked back once and did think I saw a shadow scurrying away from a car. In a moment, the shadow disappeared into the darkness and was lost. You see something? No, I said, shaking my head and turning back. We drove quietly for a while, following the road out to the point. I know artists who lives down the road, I said, when we passed the beach road. His name's Kenneth Childs. He's the Judge Child's son. I've heard of him, Robert said. In fact, I think we have one of his paintings in the hotel. It was there when we bought the place. Most likely, he's one of the most famous artists. He's a nice man, but he keeps to himself. Some people call him a hermit. I'd still like to meet him. I like his painting in the hotel, Robert said, putting his arm around my shoulders as, as he slowed the car. I took a few exploratory rides down this way recently, he said. Oh, and for what reason, I teased. Just to see the countryside, he claimed with an impish little smile. Moments later, he turned down a narrow beach road and then switched off his headlights and continued a few yards farther. Darkness closed in behind us and on both sides, but before 
us was the ocean with the dazzling sea of stars above and its moonwalk that meant the end of the world. Many times before, Carrie and I had sat in darkness and looked up at the vastness of space with all the stars twinkling, but it never set my heart pounding as it did this night while I leaned over against Robert's shoulder, feeling his breath on my hair and then on my forehead before his lips gently touched my ears and my cheeks and my eyes. I turned to bring my lips to his and we started a soft kiss. Laura, he said, stroking my hair. He put his cheek to mine and whispered in my ear. When I first saw you in school, I felt as if your face was immediately printed in my mind. That first day I looked for you everywhere. And if I changed classes and didn't see you, I was sick with disappointment. I noticed you too, but I didn't think you were looking at me in a special way. That was because I was too shy to say anything. I thought you would take one good look at my face and know I had fallen head over heels. I was afraid you'd laugh at me. I never would. I know that now, he said, putting the tips of his fingers on my lips. But I didn't know until I spoke to you and how wonderful you really were. I was walking around in a daydream, even at home. I remember I walked right into the kitchen door and bumped my forehead. My father thought I was taking drugs or something. Then my mother looked at me and said, he met a girl. I don't know anything else in the world that would turn a boy his age into a clumsy, absent-minded oaf. She said that? My mother has a great sense of humor, Robert said. I can't wait for you to meet her. Does she meet all your girlfriends, I asked. He smiled. I haven't had many girlfriends and never one like you, he replied. Before you, what I felt for other girls was a schoolboy's crush. But when I look at you, Laura, I know it's for real. I hope you feel the same way. I do, Robert, I said, I really do, I added, and we kissed again. This time when we kissed, his lips moved down to my neck and I closed my eyes and I let my head rest against his shoulder. His hands moved along my ribs and over my dress. At first, I instinctively brought my hands up to stop him, but the tingle was so pleasant and it warmed me wonderfully, and I let him continue. Robert sensed my hesitation and then my quick surrender. It made him kiss me faster and harder, his lips rushing over mine and then to my neck. For a long, delicious moment, my heart was pounding. I thought I might die from anticipation, and then when his lips came down upon me, I thought I'd die of pleasure. The rush of excitement crashed against my better judgment. I knew I should tell him to slow down, but I felt like I was floating. I was on a wave of passion, a wave that was carrying me out too far. Wait, I heard myself say finally. We're moving too quickly, Robert, I'm afraid. He lifted his face and his eyes were closed. He took a deep breath and caught a hold of the wild passion that was pulling him. You're right, Laura, he said. I just couldn't help it. I know a lot of girls wouldn't stop you, Robert. I understand if you're angry at me. No, he said, smiling, it's just the opposite. I want it to be something special, very special. I want us to move as quickly as we both want to move and love as we both want to love. I want this to last, Laura, I really do. I nodded. If we don't stop now, I won't be able to, Laura, he confessed. He leaned back against the car door and I sat up and fixed my clothes. He had to help me with my dress zipper. Then we just sat there in each other's arms listening to our hearts calm themselves. Suddenly Robert looked at his watch. Wow, I didn't realize how long we've been out here. We better get going or you'll be late for your curfew. He started the engine and put the car into reverse. 
We heard the tires spin, but the car didn't move. What the? He gunned the engine and the tires squealed, kicking up more sand and slapped at the belly of the car, but still we didn't move. He put the car into drive and tried to move forward, then back, rocking the vehicle, but it didn't work either. Oh no, he moaned. He reached over to open the glove compartment and take out a flashlight. Then he got out and shined near the rear, view t rear tires. I dug a hole in the sand and I didn't realize it was so soft here. Robert, what are we gonna do? I'll have to run back until I can find a house with lights and have him call a tow truck. I'm sorry, I've ruined everything. There's no way we can explain. Suddenly a set of headlights brightened up in the sky. Robert brought his hand to his forehead to shade his eyes. What the hell, who, who is it Robert? I asked terrified. I can't make him out yet. I think it's Carrie, he declared. And for another moment, I turned to look and I would never mistake that silhouetted form. It was Carrie walking along the beach road, his truck headlights on behind him. Carrie, I cried as soon as he drew close enough. Got yourself in a bit of trouble, I see, Carrie said with his hands on his hip, glaring down at us. Yes, I didn't realize. That's because you aren't from around here, he said disdainfully. You think these roads are like old dirt back roads where you can take your girlfriends, huh? No, Robert protested, but Carrie turned to me. This was stupid, Laura, he said to me. I thought you knew better. What are you doing here, Carrie? How did you find us? I saw you leave the school dance and thought you were going home. When you kept going forward to the point, well, just lucky for you, I decided to trail along for a while. A while, I thought. We've been here a long time. What was he doing all that time? He turned to Robert. I'll back my truck in. I've got a chain on it. We'll hook the axle and pull you out. Get in and put it in the car into neutral, he ordered. Robert got back in the car quickly. And make sure you don't have your brakes on, Carrie warned before returning to his truck. I can't believe your brother, Robert mumbled. We turned and watched Carrie turn the truck around and back it up towards us. He approached with the chain, crawled under Robert's car. Why would he follow us like this, Robert whispered. Lucky for us he did, I replied, choosing not to even think about his question at the moment. It's all set, Carrie called, get ready. He returned to the truck and slowly drove forward. We felt Robert's car jerk and then lift out of the holes that we had dug with the tires. The car bounced along the beach road until we were on more solid ground. Carrie stopped and returned to detach the chain. Robert stepped out. Thanks a lot, he said sheepishly. I didn't do it for you, I did it for Laura, Carrie replied. He stepped over to my side of the car. You better come home with me, Laura, he said. I'll take her home, Robert said. It looks like it's safer if she drives with me, Carrie said. And even in the darkness, I could see Robert turn bright red. If I don't come home with Robert, Daddy will wonder why, Carrie. So? You're not going to tell him about this, I pleaded. No, of course not, he said quickly. Okay, but it's getting late, he warned. He looked at Robert, and I'm not going to hang around here to bail you out again. He strutted back to the truck and then drove away. Robert got back in the car and pulled out, driving slowly. Why did he follow us, Laura? He was bored, I suppose, I said. It was weak, but it was all I could think to say. Was he there all the time, sitting in his truck right behind us, watching us, spying on us? I started to speak, but just shook my head instead. These idiots back at the dance were right, you know. He was in the parking lot. You've got to help him, Laura. You've got to help him realize you can't be his little sister forever, Robert said. I know, Robert. Let's not talk about it right now, please, I begged. Just thinking about Carrie's weird obsession with Robert and me brought tears to my eyes and put a lump in my throat. Okay, he said, and we both uncomfortably drove in silence to my house. I'm sorry for what happened 
Robert said after we parked in the driveway. Carrie was right to ball me out for it. I just hope it didn't ruin your night. No, it didn't. I had a wonderful time, Robert. Really, I did. Me too, he said. I'll call you tomorrow, okay? Let me call you. It'll be easier that way, I said. Okay, if that's what you want. He looked worried. I'll call, I promise, I said. He smiled, <clears throat> and we kissed quickly before I hopped out of his car. Thanks again for the wonderful evening, Robert. Good night, Laura. I closed the door and looked over at Carrie's truck. He was already in the house when I entered. I found Daddy had waited up for me and was sitting in the living room reading. He looked up from the book. I held my breath, wondering whether Carrie had decided to say something after all. Have a good time, Daddy asked. Yes, Daddy, it was very nice. Everybody behaved themselves? Yes, Daddy. He nodded and lowered his voice. Your mother didn't come home much earlier than you. Your brother didn't come home much earlier than you. I think he got a secret girlfriend, am I right? He asked quickly, unable to keep the hope from his voice. I felt the blood drain from my face and I shook my head, hating lying to Daddy. I don't know, Daddy. He's never mentioned any girl to me, I said. Daddy stared a moment and then shrugged. Oh well, he said. He'll tell us if he wants to. I just hope it's not someone he thinks we'd be ashamed of. Daddy continued to gaze at me with questioning eyes. I pressed my teeth on my lower lip and shook my head. I don't know, Daddy. How I wished it were true that Carrie had found a girlfriend, I thought sadly. Well, Daddy said, looking at the clock on the mantel. Young, Mr. Royce brought you home on time. That's good. He sighed deeply and stretched out his arms. It's late though. So I guess I'll go to sleep too, he added and yawned. Don't forget, we're going to Grandma Olivia and Grandpa Samuel's tomorrow for brunch. Okay, good night, Daddy, I said, happy to get away from his questioning eyes. I hurried up the stairs, pausing on the landing. I saw the door to Carrie's room was closed and quickly went into my own room, closing the door behind me. I leaned against it and caught my breath. It was only then that I finally got myself to relax with relief. Unwilling to take off my party dress just yet, I went to my bed and sat there for a while, thinking about the magical night Robert and I had shared. What an evening, I thought, and then my memories of Robert's kisses and his embrace and touch returned, washing over me in a warm reverie. I lie back and sigh and close my eyes, thinking about his hands and his lips made me tingle. As I thought about him, I moved my hands where his had been. I started to undress, and in moments I was naked, standing in front of my mirror, gazing dreamily at myself, imagining Robert beside me. Finally, my fatigue hit me, and I went to the bathroom to rinse off my makeup. It felt so good to crawl under my blanket and snuggle up. Despite it all, I thought, it was a wonderful night. It really was. I reached over to turn off the small lamp beside my bed and dropped my head on the pillow. The sound of the floor above creaking popped my eyes open and drove away my sweet thoughts. I held my breath and listened. It was Carrie. I heard him open the attic door, drop the ladder, and descend as quietly as he could. He had been up there the whole time, maybe peeping through the hole at me, I thought. I felt my body grow hot with embarrassment and the blood rush towards the surface of my skin. How much had he seen? We had stopped bathing and sharing the bathroom when we were seven or eight, and I began to demand my privacy even more when I began develop, bre developing breasts. Carrie's curious eyes had made me feel self-conscious. It was long afterward that I stopped walking around in front of him in my underwear. Even then, the way he looked at me and my changing body made me uncomfortable. I got up and went to the door, opening it slightly to peer out as he returned the ladder. I started to open the door wider, then hesitated. If I confronted him, it would only bring more embarrassment to myself, I thought. It was late, I told myself. It wasn't the time for this. I closed the door ever so softly and waited until I heard him go into his room. 
Then I went back to bed and lie there with my eyes open, trying desperately to drive the troubled thoughts from my mind so I could think only of Robert and our wonderful night together. But when I turned to my side and closed my eyes, I saw only Carrie's angry face after he had emerged from the darkness behind us, his truck headlights casting him in an eerie silhouette. I finally drifted to sleep only to find that Carrie was in my nightmares along with the distorted faces of my classmates whispering, leering, laughing, chasing me toward the roaring sea. Everything was so vivid. I woke up in a sweat after the first wave washed over me in my dream. My heart was pounding. I sat up quickly and had to hold my hand over my heart and take deep breaths. Finally, I got up and went to the bathroom and splashed cold water on my face. Whenever Carrie and I had a nightmare, we would share it the next morning. It was the way we both would drive the demons out of our hearts and to comfort each other. For the first time, I couldn't tell him about my dream. This time, I had to wait. I had to find a way to drive out the demon myself.